Hey, Sardis, we know you've been living in a Zoom world with bad lighting, masks that cover your mouth and nose, and perhaps pajamas have replaced formal attire. Listen, we'll take you any way we can get you, but we wanted you to consider a few ways that you might help brighten the mood of our virtual meeting house during the Lenten season. You can wear bright colors. I mean, why wait until Easter to display your favorite pastels? How about a nice mint green t-shirt? Everybody likes green. Or maybe you've got a nice springy yellow in the closet. Hey, yellows, chicks, peeps, Easter, yay! Or maybe your partner loves flamingos and you just feel like getting tropical. Listen, we want to see you in bright colors, so wear whatever you'd like. You might also consider getting creative with your Zoom backgrounds. You could show us your messy kitchen uh, or your corner nook. Or how about a nice view of the garden? Hey, that's bright, springy and joyful and happy. Don't you feel peaceful and alive and full of energy? But really, why stop at a cozy kitchen or a, or a garden when you could have Paris in the springtime. Now, maybe backgrounds aren't your thing. How about a Zoom filter? I mean, yes, Paris in the springtime is nice, but what about Paris in pink or 
Paris with Christmas lights or Paris with happy faces. So maybe you think this is silly and, and perhaps it is, but we wanna encourage you to do your best to make your little space as bright and cheery as possible. And maybe the brightness and cheer that you bring will, will be extended to community members who need to feel some joy. So thanks for playing along, Sardis. We hope to see your creativity in effect as we continue our Zoom worship during the season of Lent. Welcome to Sardis. We're so glad you joined us today. Come on in and let's worship. Good morning and thanks for joining us on this third Sunday of Lent. We are happy to have you with us on Zoom or watching on Facebook. Amelia Earhart said, a single act of kindness throws out roots in all directions and the roots spring up and make new trees. 
If this quote was truly about trees, then we would be overtaken by forests. On behalf of all the Sardis staff, thank you for your love and generosity. We have all cashed our love offering checks and are grateful. We recently shared a link to a five-year Sardis Baptist recap that Reverend Bob Stillerman put together. If you have not had an opportunity to check it out, please do so. You can find the link in last week's Sardis Happenings email or in the March issue of Signposts. It is remarkable to see all that we have accomplished in the last five years. Also look for a video message from Bob where he will walk through the presentation and share more about how the information included will be used to shape our vision for the future. Um, if you're worshiping with us today, you likely already know that we have approached Lent differently this year. This season, we are commemorating the life that Jesus led and honoring our own vitality. There are five or six ways that you can participate in our theme. Details for all of those are in our weekly happenings email, but one option is to send us a selfie Thank you to those of you who have submitted your pictures, but we only have a few so far. We are creating a uh, mosaic cross and each of you will receive a copy before Easter, but this will only be the special keepsake that we hope it will be if we have your photos to include. So please email them to the church by March 15th to allow us time to put this together. This season, we have an opportunity for you to help our homeless neighbors as well as pay homage to loved ones. In lieu of Easter lilies, you may purchase honorariums by making $15 donations to our Roof Above Fund. The money we collect will support their effort to provide resources to Charlotte's homeless population. Honorees will be recognized during worship on Easter morning as well as that week in our email. Um, I will include information in today's chat about how to place an order and uh, we'll also include that information in our email. That is all the announcements I have today. So let us now enter into our time of worship together. This morning and every time we gather, we acknowledge the symbols of our faith, the empty cross reminding us of Christ's constant love for us, the flame reminding us that God's light shines in the world, a light which the darkness did not overcome, the word a witness to God's love for humanity in every generation, and the creation window, a reminder of God's creative parenting breath. Each liturgical season offers an additional context in which to view the symbols of our faith. Too often, Lent has used the cross as a symbol of atonement, Christ's death as an agent of our grace. This season, we choose to reclaim the cross as a symbol of life. For us, the cross is testament to how one should live in love, the life of Jesus models compassion and service for us and reveals the divine in our own lives. In reclaiming the cross, we also reclaim two modern symbols as symbols of life, the mask and the zoom grid, hidden smiles and the faces of our friends in two dimensions will not dampen nor detract from the value of community. The mask and the zoom grid, just like the cross, will help us resurrect life soon. Please pray with me. Gracious and life-giving God, may our worship today help us turn toward you in all that we do. May the words and songs and images that we hear and see shape our daily testament to you. May we be a community that looks for the light of Christ that shines in every place and every time, even perhaps times like Lent when we've been taught to see the darkness. 
We know that you call us to live out our faith in ways that honor you and bless our neighbors. Use our worship to foster our desire for connections with both neighbors and forgotten bystanders. Help us to live by the values of love, justice, peace, and to bring sacred meaning to all of life. Amen. Take off your cross, the Savior said, if you would my disciple be, take care of those who need me most, and humbly follow after me. Take up your cross, let not the weight fill your tired spirit with alarm. His strength will bear your spirit up and brace your heart and nerve your arm. Take up your cross which gives you strength, which makes your trembling spirit brave. It guides you to a abundant life and leads to victory over hate. Sardis friends, this is Amanda. As Tilly asked me to reflect on, on words of life, what's been giving me life over this past year, I had a hard time trying to figure out what that was at first. And then it dawned on me. It's this space right here. We're at Bennett's High School on the softball field. It's fenced in so Fredward can run around. I think he's somewhere over there in the distance running around today. But we've spent a lot of time here. A lot, a lot of time. Afternoons in the sunshine, cold and rainy days. We were even here on Christmas morning. Spending time together as a family and time in God's creation. We've also been spending a lot of time hiking. I think Bennett and I have clocked 39 miles over the past few months. Spending our weekends out on trails. Sometimes we're hiking really fast and sometimes we're stopping for Fred to sniff feels good to be away for a little while. We can never out-hike or out-run COVID. It's still here right now. But it's been a powerful thing to be just still in God's creation. To look around and realize there's nobody else around. It's just us, just the birds, the leaves, just the glory of God's creation. It's been a really powerful reminder to my spirit on heavy days. And there have been a lot of heavy days too but it's been good and life-giving. I hope that there are things that are giving you life this week, this month, that have been helping to get you through this past year. I miss you all. I cannot wait until we get to spend time together, we get to be close together, maybe even hug as a happy thought. And I look forward to it. Blessings on you all.
Our scripture passage comes from the Gospel of John, New Testament reading, and it's uh, chapters 2, verses 13 through 16. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. The word of the Lord for the people of Christ. In the past two weeks, we've looked at the story of Noah and the covenant God made with his family and with us as well. Pastor Bob said, God's promise is for everyone, for everything, and in every time of our lives. Last week, we looked at the story of Abraham and Sarah and the covenant God made with them and their descendants, including all of us. Pastor Bob reminded us that God is with each one of us with the whole of creation and is still creating. Everybody, everything, and every time. I will keep that theme alive today. We heard the passage from Exodus read earlier and you no doubt recognized the Ten Commandments. And of course, they are for everybody. Why or how are they for everybody, you might ask? And I'll be glad you did, because I want to tell you. The first two Sundays of Lent were about covenants and promises. But at some point after those covenants, and promises, I can imagine someone asking, what do I have to do to earn these benefits of this covenant? We know they were offered for everybody and at every time, but coming out of a flood or an exile would no doubt change their perspective. And being in a pandemic may have changed our perspective as well. We've been conditioned to believe that when something nice is done for us, like these covenants, we are asked to do something in exchange. Perhaps it was the same in the times of Noah and Nehemiah, his wife, and Abraham and Sarah. What's this going to cost me? What do I have to do? We might ask. Is there something required of me to receive the benefit of this covenant? The answer, of course, is no. But for those who just have to have some action items, we have this brief and lasting list of 10 do's and don'ts given later to the children of Israel. Do's and don'ts fit right in with traditional themes of Lent. You can't read a list like that without feeling some guilt for how you failed to keep all the commandments. One writer described the feeling he got 
from reflecting on the Ten Commandments as being taken to the woodshed. We've all heard that phrase, and we can all picture it in our minds. A place where a person is taken away from the others, where the person is told in no uncertain terms what he or she did wrong. So thoughts from the woodshed may be thoughts about sin and guilt and punishment and an angry God. One question that is always good to ask oneself in the woodshed moments is, why am I here? Or even, how did I get here? The thing is, guilt and shame can be effective, but they're not good ways to motivate. We have a God who loves everyone and everything every day. That God doesn't want us to wallow in guilt, I'm certain. Instead, God wants us to strive to be our best selves. And the Ten Commandments can help us do that. Love at its best doesn't use shame and guilt, but it does at times get angry. I mentioned earlier that the pandemic may have changed our perspective. I believe it has at times. In fact, I know it has at times. One thing the Ten Commandments don't tell us is how to handle our anger. I guess it's possible that Mel Brooks' portrayal of Moses in The History of the World, Part One, was spot on when he stood before the Israelites with three tablets saying, I give you these 15, one tablet falls to the ground and shatters, 10 commandments. Maybe there were more of them and they covered anger, who knows? But fortunately for us, today's gospel lesson presents an angry Jesus to help us on our way. It's the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, and it's one of those stories that appears in all four Gospels. It comes later in Jesus' ministry in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but in John, it comes toward the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Ann and I were talking about this passage and wondering why this particular visit to the temple was the last straw for Jesus. What is it about Jesus' visit this time that was different from his previous visits? Surely he would have seen this setting before. The animals and money changers had a right to be there. The animals were there because of the Torah's requirement of sacrifice. The money changers were there to change pilgrims' money into the coinage the temple could receive to purchase sacrifices and also for the payment of the half-shekel tax levied on all Jews. This was not something brand new. Jesus had surely seen it before. So why now? What is it about this day or this time that caused his anger to explode? Had his anger volcano been smoking for a while, moving ever closer to eruption? Did a squabble among the disciples set off his tirade? Was he upset because he knew 
the days of the need for sacrifice were coming to a close. The gospel writers don't provide this information for us. I have heard many angry comments about COVID-19 and masks. I've probably made many of them myself. And I wonder if this issue would have evoked similar anger in Jesus. Some have said that wearing a mask or not wearing a mask might be politically motivated. But I know many Republicans and Democrats who wear masks constantly. The comments I've heard are often based on the advice of healthcare professionals and the anger many feel seeing blatant disregard for these simple preventative measures. I can understand this. I've driven by bars on several occasions, seeing huge crowds gathered outside, not socially distanced and not a mask in sight. Driving past those same bars pre-pandemic, I hardly noticed the crowds at all. It's only in the middle of a pandemic that things like that draw our attention. It makes me want to start yelling at those people, and that's not my usual reaction. We don't know why this visit to the temple prompted Jesus' rage, but we do know that something unholy was going on from his words. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. The paintings by master artists show Jesus in a very different light from what we usually imagine. And I think it's good for us to see. The release of anger can be a healthy thing. Anger left to fester is never a good thing. And it can often lead to destruction and or depression. It's the way we express our anger that is important, whether in a pandemic or a temple. Jesus showed us that righteous anger can be a good thing. I wonder, is there any injustice that is calling us to some righteous anger and constructive action? If so, may we find it, and may we find it soon. Amen.
You are now invited into a few minutes of community with Sardis Friends. The pictures on the screen are from a work day back in 2019. And this time of year, we often schedule a church work day to prepare our grounds for Easter. So greet one another. And if time allows, the prompt today is to consider what life-giving work have you done during this past difficult year. You will all now be invited into a breakout room. <laughs> 